Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. My name is Ruth Ellel. I'm a Senior Development Officer in the Alumni Office here at Manchester, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Alumni Insights Lecture. So our speaker this evening is Professor Uma Katari. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Bertrand Tate, here to introduce Uma in a few moments. But Tate is the head of our Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute. So it's an institute that brings together researchers in the humanities with medics and also aid practitioners in the humanitarian sector. So a few housekeeping notices before we start. If I could ask you all please to turn mobile phones off or to silent. For fire safety, we're not expecting a fire alarm. So if we do hear one, we can um, leave by the two doors on either side of the lecture theatre and back down the stairs. I do hope you enjoy tonight's lecture, and I do hope you'll stay for a drink afterwards. Thank you very much. Hello. I'm um, immensely proud to be asked to introduce Uma Kotari uh, on, as, as an alumnus of the University of Manchester, as a director of a, of a small institute, sibling to the Global Development Institute, which was created this year as a result of the merger of two of the university's most prestigious institutes, notably. Uh, and I think we, we have here an, an immense opportunity because Uma Kotari, who has been leading the GDI this year, is one of those polymath, one of the remarkable academics that make the University of Manchester one of the great centers for the study of development and for the study of international aid. Uma is a professor of migration and postcolonial studies. She actually has written extensively on histories, discourses, representation of international development. She has researched in the field and she has won the Busk Medal by the Royal Geographical Society for her field work supporting the understanding of global development. She is one of the most um, cited authors, I think, in, in, a, in a field. She's also worked extensively on trans -mi transnational migrations and diaspora. I'm not going to read the long list of fantastic books that she's authored and the, the vast number of articles she's written. I invite you to check a, 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 a profile. It's absolutely staggering. But I would like to name the, a couple of titles to give you a sense of... of attitude to research. Her latest book is, for example, The Radical History of Development Studies, and she's also involved in development theories and practice, critical perspectives, which was before, but another book in 2001, which was quite a hit because it, it challenged everything people claimed to know, was Participation, the New Tyranny. So Uma Kotari is a wonderful example of somebody who actually does immense field work, engages profoundly with theory, challenges us every inch of the way to rethink everything we know, how we know it, and why we know it. So you're in for a treat, and so am I, and I'd like you to welcome her very warmly, please. Thank you. And um, Bertrand, I didn't know you felt that way. That's just absolutely lovely. Thank you very much for that very kind and generous introduction. And thank you to the um, alumni events team for organising this lecture. And thanks to all of you for coming here and sitting in rather a gloomy lecture theatre when the sun is very rarely shining outside. Um, I'm really pleased to give this lecture because it's given me an opportunity to reflect on some of the research that I've been carrying out over the last 15 to 20 years, and to locate it really in the moment, in what's happening today, and to try and understand that. So, everyone is on the move. We all travel from one place to another. We move between places for different lengths of time, varying distances. So mobility is not exceptional. It's not unusual. In fact, uh, Mimi Scheller and John Uri write that we, would, we live in a world that is best understood as being constituted by mobility. Not just the movement of people, but of finance, of ideas, of technology, of resources. But of course there's a whole variety of forms of movement. Causes, motives, distances covered and periods of time. And one such form of movement was very evident in research that I carried out 
amongst Senegalese and Bangladeshi street traders in, who were living and working in Barcelona. And what, I interviewed one of them, and he said, I'm 35 years old. I come from Dhaka in Bangladesh. I've been selling scarves on the streets in Barcelona for five months, but I left Dhaka eight years ago. I went first to India, then I went to Dubai where I worked in a restaurant, then to Austria, then on to Germany, but I had to leave because I couldn't get my papers there. I left and went to Italy where I sold things on the street, but I couldn't get my papers there either. Now I'm in Barcelona. I've applied for my papers and they say it's easier to get them in Spain. If I do get them, I will reach my dream, which is to go to Bradford. <laughs> for those of you who are unfamiliar with the cultural geography of Britain, Bradford is for some of us a world city. <laughs> where I have an uncle and get a job there. If not, then to Belgium where I have some friends and try there. I've been to many places, but I can't stop traveling until I get my papers. It's a difficult life. And at the end of the interview, he said to me, do you have documents? Do you have papers? Well, I showed him my British passport, and I knew the question that was coming. Are you married then? <laughs> well, once word got round on the street that I did indeed have my documents, I had more proposals of marriage in the 18 months of the research project than I've had in the last 55 years. In fact, I've had none in the last 55 years. But then this lecture isn't about my sad story. Now, the reason why I, I recount this anecdote, this interview with Rehman, is because I think it raises three very important questions and issues. First of all, it really confounds the sense or the dominant way of thinking that migrants have a single place of origin and a predetermined destination. Right? He travelled over eight years going through different places. The second issue raised is just how skilled and competent migrants can become, invoking and building networks along the way, learning how to negotiate borders and boundaries. And the third is the significance and the power of the document. The only reason for his extended travel and his journey is because of policies that constrained and contained his movement. So in fact, his migratory trajectory wouldn't have been like that if border policies were different. He was only moving from one place to another because he was trying to get his documents. So interestingly, while neoliberals are arguing for the benefits of the opening up of international borders to permit freer movement of capital, um, of trade, of services, of technology, there's increasing restrictions placed on the movement of people. So what we have are these two diametrically opposed world trends. One is for greater openness, of international borders, and the other is for greater restrictiveness. Well, at the end of last year, John Simpson, BBC reporter, wrote an article and he titled it, This Migrant Crisis is Different from All Others, in which he suggests that 2015 has unquestionably been the year of the migrant. Well, when you take a historical perspective, some may find that claim is questionable. After all, haven't we seen this before? Haven't we been here before? Europe and the rest of the world, of course, have witnessed the mass movement of refugees throughout history. Indeed, a total of about 60 million Europeans became refugees during the World War II. But as the current refugee movement in Europe continues, there's one particular refrain that gets repeated over and over again, and that is that the humanitarian catastrophe of our generation is symbolized by this movement of Syrian refugees. So let's look at some statistics then. How many people are we talking about? Well, more than half of Syrians, Syria's pre-war population of 22 million have been forced to move. Seven million of them are internally displaced. There's more than a million migrants and refugees crossing into Europe in 2015. And more than four million refugees from Syria are in just five countries, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. And in this year alone, 500 have died on the journey. So some may claim that 2015 was unquestionably the year of the migrant, as John Simpson did. Others disagree and say we've seen this before. But I want to leave that debate aside, because I think what is unquestionable is that 2015 was most certainly the year of the most publicised and mediatised representation of refugees and the movement of people. 
photographs, interviews, news reports covering the rising numbers of international migrants who are arriving along the European Union's borders or have died trying to reach Europe are now ubiquitous. Every day, news bulletins, television documentaries, newspaper articles, radio programmes, forms of social media are all debating the so-called refugee crisis. And they depict the experiences of refugees, document their journeys and their arrivals, border crossings. They examine their potential impact on the people and the places they encounter and in which they arrive. Less often, perhaps now, they also inform us about the causes of this movement. And I think these reflect together multiple and very diverse political and, uh, perceptions. They invoke sympathy and compassion in some and fear and loathing in others. They're very emotive images of refugees marching through the countryside, for example, getting tangled up in barbed wire fences, the juxtaposition of police control with banners of welcome. There's just so much information pulling us in different emotional, moral and political directions. And alongside this, there's an ongoing debate on the quality of that media coverage. So clearly, we need to think very, very carefully and very fully about the power and the role of these representations. Are we skilled and knowledgeable enough to interpret what we see and what we read? Are we able to critique and challenge these representations? What tools do we have as public audiences? Are we aware of the kinds of ideologies and politics that are embedded in them? And very importantly, are we alert to how every political and policy debate today, however tangential, now appears to always and only lead to a discourse of immigration? So I think the questions that we need to ask are how does this unprecedented media coverage shape our understandings of refugees and the form and the extent of the humanitarian response? How do they generate powerful and often negative connotations that vilify refugees, instill fear and hatred and reproduce inequalities, but also at the same time forge new kinds of global alliances and solidarities that have led to the incredible outpouring of compassion and acts of kindness that we've witnessed? So building on a lot of political, challenging, creative and innovative work that's been developed not just by academics, but activists and refugees themselves, I want to explore the power and the impact of these representations. That was just all preamble. <laughs> this is the introduction. I want to focus on their journeys, and I want to focus on the possibilities of forging conviviality. We're arguably positioned at a very critical moment, that one that is replete with potential to shape the future through new forms of everyday humanitarianism. But three caveats before I begin, or before I continue. First of all, I'm not going to offer a solution in this lecture. What I want to do is provide some possible ways of looking at the current context and how it's being represented to us, and offer some possibilities. I'm not going to provide the political background to the conflict. Others, some of you here, are much more knowledgeable about this. What I want to focus on is the actual movement, the journey. And I don't want to deny the significance of many grassroots and solidarity movements. They're incredibly important. But what I want to do is to focus on the very public representations, the dominant representations. But first, as my title alludes, I want to start with what we understand by public representations and what the power of those, those representations are. So media representations constitute an integral element in the regulation of movement and the perceptions of those who move. So perhaps we need to start with what's selected for coverage. We know that there's no abstract event going on out there that's called the news, and it's waiting to be uncovered by reporters and presented on our daily news programs. Instead, of course, as we all know, there's a whole series of events that are taking place every day across the world. And through decisions that are shaped in part by ideological, national, and economic interest, some of those events are selected as being new newsworthy, as being in our public interest. It may be obvious, but as we're bombarded with mediatized representations, I think we need to remember what Raymond Williams wrote. He says, we've been wrong in taking communication as secondary. 
many people seem to assume, as a matter of course, that there's first a reality, an abstract reality that exists out there, and second, communications about it, or representations of it. The form and extent and the content of the communication itself is a major way in which reality is formed and changed. So from Williams, we can infer that messages and meanings transmitted through the media shape our taken-for-granted world. Take, for example, this media coverage that well articulates the cultural theorist Stuart Hall's ideas that all messages are encoded with political ideological meanings. So we see two here. I don't know whether you can read them. Um, and can you still hear me? Yes. yes. Um, is that the first one, this, this is after Hurricane Katrina, the first one, a black man wading through knee-deep water, and the text in the newspaper says, a young man walks through chest-deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday. The second one, two white people wading through knee-deep water. Two residents, they belong. Residents wade through chest-deep water after finding bread from their local grocery store. So Stuart Hall saying, I mean, I've juxtaposed those two. Right? This, that isn't the image we normally have. We have one or the other. And what it does is invoke a particular taken-for-granted world that we read those representations through a particular lens. So the media create and project collective imaginaries, the imaginaries of politicians, the imaginaries of civil society. And they also provide us with frameworks for including some and excluding others. For example, there's media coverage that often blames migrants of increasing unemployment rates and draining social security resources. We have statistics of Muslim family size that are invoked to support the idea about their taking over and as an ever-present threat to national security. Media coverage, thus, contributes to the per perpetuation of stereotypes that shape public opinion. And we're very well aware that negative and exaggerated images of migrants project a sense of crisis. They instill fear, often, often positioning incomers as enemies. And these are often through the, very, the use of very familiar symbols or metaphors, such as illegality, aliens, <coughs> invasions, waves of migrants, swamping, as well as drawing from very evocative images of natural catastrophes like flooding or a tsunami of refugees. And that overwhelming mediatization and the reactions to it, however, also serve as a reminder that we have, and there are, and there continue to be, challenges made to those dominant representations. And as I'll show later, we're not simply passive recipients or victims of these representations, that we do have agency and we do exercise that agency to ask questions of them, to interrogate them in particular ways. And that's what Stuart Hall calls decoding, so we have the encoding of messages, ideological messages, but we're also active in decoding them, that we have agency. So another issue that I think we need to think about in terms of representations is whose stories are considered worthy of narration and from what perspective? Who's able to recount their own history? While there remain few opportunities for self-representation, there's a growing recognition that those who move and settle do have agency and can narrate their own lives. And this has in part been enabled by the use of social and digital media. Many Syrians are recording events on their mobile phones, and the innovative Syria Mobile Film Festival has given them a voice through screening their short films. So we have a diversity of representations that are enabled by moving beyond the text, moving beyond media, print media and news media, to films, art, music. Yasmin Fedad's documentary, Queens of Syria, follows the journey of a group of 50 female refugees, and she says that the world wasn't hearing ordinary Syrians' voices, and her documentary was one way of doing that. But still, these aren't mainstream. They're not public, in a sense. So the, there's still the problems of dominant representations shaping and over-influencing the ways in which we think. <clears throat> Another concern in terms of the power of representations that's been brought to the fore in the current context is how we use and abuse labels, categorizations, and definitions of different groups of people who move. 
And I think there's two general issues here. The first is that certain kinds of movement have been viewed as the privilege of only certain kinds of people. So, for example, there's often the assumption that people from the third world travel primarily for economic gain or as a consequence of the incompetence of their own governments. While the search for adventure, exploration, tourism tends to be reserved for first world travelers. So, while you may know this adventurer, Hillary, as he reached the summit of Mount Everest in the early 1950s, and these kinds of representations that were prevalent at that time, you probably don't know these remarkable people, or indeed people like them, my parents, who at the same time that Hillary was climbing Everest, they had borrowed money and from friends and family and arrived on a steamer to Southampton from Bombay. They bought a Morris Minor and spent the next six months traveling overland back to India. When asked at the border of Egypt and Sudan why they were traveling, they looked at each other, a bit confused by the question. And then they turned to the border control officers and they said, for an adventure. They just didn't fit the stereotype. The second issue relates less to the form of movement, but the terminology to describe those who move. Language is very powerful. When non-Western people move to gain better livelihoods and employment opportunities, they tend to be referred to as economic migrants. But those who move from Europe for better jobs are called expatriates. Those currently escaping political oppression are referred to as refugees. But I'm sure that if the 19% of Americans who say that they'll move to Canada if Trump is elected did move, they wouldn't be referred to as political refugees. And why aren't the 800,000 Britons who've settled in Spain referred to as the British diaspora? Well, more seriously, this is reflective of an ongoing and problematic distinction in terminology, whereby categories and definitions become tarnished and they're invoked to shape public opinion for or against people who move. They also divide people who move. These labels strip migrants and refugees of their humanity, and it's impossible for us to see them as individuals when they become simply a category. When the Daily Express used the headline, eight million migrants live in the UK, to whom were they referring? Well, actually, it doesn't really matter because the idea was to alarm, not inform the public. Globally, nearly 60 million people have been forcibly displaced. It's fair to say that most of them are not in it to take advantage of the British benefit system. So apart from instilling fear, policy implications are implemented on the basis of such spurious definitions and distinctions. They separate people into good and bad migrants, economic migrants, refugees, peace-loving workers and potential terrorists. And what a lottery there will be now, as for every one returned to Turkey, one is allowed to seek asylum. How are those choices going to be made? Well, attempts have been made by journalists to acknowledge that definitions are problematic. And now any article about the Syrian refugees on the BBC West website has a note of terminology at the bottom. And Al Jazeera English have announced that they'll no longer use the word migrant, but use the word term refugee instead. But David Marsh, the journalist, questions, why do we need to refer to a particular term at all? Why not just call them people? They are people. Men, women and children, fathers, mothers, teachers, engineers, just like us, except they come from Syria or Eritrea or Afghanistan. One journalist said that whenever possible, he tries to describe those in camps as people, initially, with an extended phrase along the lines of more than 3,000 people who, f who fled war, poverty or persecution beyond Europe's borders, etc. So it is possible for us to avoid those kinds of categorizations. And who were they before? They became a refugee, an economic migrant. Apart from the absent histories, and the definitional problems, labeling conceals who these people were before. There's been a tendency, as Peter Gatrell writes, to discard as unimportant the life they lived hitherto. So when my parents did move to the UK in the 1950s, just a couple of years after their adventure, no longer were they travelers, teachers, politically engaged people. They were simply immigrants, 
And it was that appellation that ensured that no one would rent them a room or that they could get a mortgage. So who, who are the Syrians before they were forced to leave and begin their arduous and traumatic journey? We know very little about them. But I want to move on now and to talk about the journey itself. When understanding motives or moving or mapping patterns of mobility, we tend to think in very simplistic terms, dichotomous terms, such as people are pushed out of a place because of war or conflict, and they move to another place where they seek peace, or that there's a single place of origin and a predetermined destination. But most movements aren't like that at all. They're much more complicated, involving multiple migrations, often with no known destination. So we need to pay much more attention, it seems to me, to the journey. Because migration is, after all, not an act, but a process. What's revealing about the coverage of this current situation is that the reporting has primarily focused on the journey. We haven't looked at the journey so often in previous um, work or literature or research, and indeed in media coverage. So why is it that this particular moment, this particular context, so much of what we read and see is about the journey. We've witnessed the traumatic and dangerous journeys across water, over land, and in camps. And I want to start with the imagery of the water and the land. More than a million migrants arrived by sea in 2015, 35,000 by land. Nearly 4,000 of them were reported to have died trying to cross the Mediterranean. Representations of these particular journeys have invoked very specific images, whereas Steinberg writes, the sea is represented as a space of danger and land as safety. So Europe's refugee crisis is presented as a battle against the sea. Nations are being galvanized by the sobering image of a drowned Syrian toddler on a beach in Turkey, and Banksy has drawn attention to the refugee crisis with a very provocative reinterpretation of the EU flag as a series of floating corpses at sea. Across the political spectrum and in a variety of media, narrations of the refugee crisis and calls for intervention posit the sea as a space of danger. Some focus on the dangers that the sea spits up onto the shore, onto Europe's shores, migrants, Muslims, terrorists. Others focus on the sea itself as a danger that challenges Europeans to find their inner humanity. The impulse then is to script the crisis as one in which refugees must be saved from the sea. And what that does is set the sea and the water against the land, where Europe becomes the land of safety, of civil society and home. So what's happened through those representations, it seems to me, is that our gaze has shifted away from the problems of the land to the dangers of the sea. But for the refugee, land is not necessarily the space of life and water, the space of death. While they are indeed seeking refuge from the sea, water is not the central danger in their lives. It is the land. The problems emanate not from the sea, but from the land. And it's on land where changes must be made in order for us to protect refugees. And alluding to these representations and challenging a prevailing discourse that has arisen around them, the question, why would someone risk such a journey? The British Somali poet, Wasan Shire, has written, you have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. The conditions, therefore, are no deterrent to embarking on the journey. Like the photo of Antonis Georgis rescuing Wagasi Nebiat, it's all too easy to think of the beach as the conclusion of an arduous journey, an end point. You've arrived. But as the experiences of countless refugees suggest, it's something much more ambiguous, a liminal point on a journey where the future will, in all likelihood, be only a marginal improvement on the past, a node of brief respite on a series of journeys that, the, that, in the case of the refugee, will now proceed on land. And what about the power? Sorry, that was the, for the last one. What about the power of a single image? Many of you are familiar 
you will have seen the images of Aylan Kurdi, the three-year-old boy whose lifeless body was washed up on a Turkish beach. For a long time, the news media have published photos of Syrian refugees, images of the dead, wounded and displaced, but few of them have made such an impression. Why was this one such an effective call to action? Well, Douglas Brinkley, professor of history at Rice University, suggests that once in a while, an image breaks through that noisy, cluttered global culture and hits people in the heart and not in the head. And the documentary filmmaker and historian Ken Burns said that the power of the single image to convey complex information is still there. It has that power to shock and arrest us, to make us stop and interrupt the flow. We were somehow brought together by this image. For some, the familiarity of the child, the Velcro strap shoes, the red t-shirt, is what made the photo resonate because that child looks so much like children you and I know. And that image became a symbol of a moment in the crisis. It's had the power to transform that agonizingly slow conversation of politics and diplomacy to a kind of urgency that actually permits us as human beings to transcend, in a way, the limitations that are imposed by our own politics and our own institutions. And of course, it compelled David Cameron to announce that Britain will now take thousands of Syrian refugees, marking a very dramatic U-turn following a public outcry for him to do more after these images were published. He said, as a father and as a human being, you cannot help but be moved by these terrible pictures. Those images will remain with all of us for a very, very long time. But they didn't. They didn't remain with us for a long time. That's the temporality of the news. That's the temporality of public and popular representations. And Cameron asks then, why would they risk the hazardous journey? Well, surely the question is not that, but why is the journey so hazardous? Surely it's a consequence of European border regimes. And the leader of the far-right German party, Petri, the party alternative for development, said border police should shoot at refugees entering the country illegally. They should use firearms if necessary, prevent illegal border crossings. They must stop them entering German soil. And of course, there's a lot of discrepancies between various member states' responses to refugees. The differences in terms of the number of asylum, asylum applications so Germany has the most asylum applications in 2015, but Hungary has the highest in proportion to its population. It has nearly 2,000 refugee um, asylum applications per 100,000 population in Hungary. Do any of you know how many the UK has? Hungary has 2,000 per 100,000 population. How many does the UK have? 60. 60. The average in Europe, the EU average, is 260 applications per 100,000 population. At the same time, there's policies and beliefs, real or imagined, that make certain member states more desirable destinations than others for refugees. And this week, we witnessed very powerful images of refugees crossing from Greece into Macedonia after finding a way through the border fence. Because Macedonia last week said that it would no longer let any migrants in, blocking the so-called Balkan route north. So the local UNHCR representative told the BBC, what we're seeing is a return of chaos whenever there's a unilateral decision to close the borders, when there's no coordination, when countries in Europe just don't coordinate, they don't share responsibility, then we see more misery for refugees. And the journey's further being shaped by the emergence of a new and a different kind of politics. The EU and Turkey proposal. There is no crisis these days, as you can see, without a celebrity, in this case, Angelina Jolie. The EU and the Turkey proposal last week set out a plan to ease the movement of refugees into the EU. All migrants arriving in Greece from Turkey would be sent back. And for each Syrian returned, a Syrian in Turkey would be resettled. But part of that plan also was to ease access to the EU for Turkish citizens, to speed up that process, with a view to allowing visa-free travel by June. 
the EU promised to pay 3 billion euros in terms of aid to help Turkey deal with the crisis. And finally, preparations will be made, and this is part of the deal, the agreement, for opening up new chapters in talks on EU membership for Turkey. Well, this sets up a really worrying, worrying distinction between people. If Turkey restricts the entry of Syrians, then Europe will allow more Turks in, restricting the movement of some to ensure the freedom of movement for others. Again, then, the refugees and the situation is being appropriated for the political gains and interests of others. So refugees endure the traumatic and hazardous sea journey, but the land that awaits them is rarely one of seamless assimilation or of freedom. They must negotiate borders and boundaries, and then their mobility is restricted because they're placed in camps, detention centers, or guarded and holding places where they're neither assimilated nor rejected, but placed, in a sense, in a state of limbo. Theirs is a detached geography, caused by dislocation and social rupture from their homelands, detached from outside the camps and from legal and social protection. The spatially controlled environment of the camp seals refugees from contact with the outside and therefore exacerbates, in a sense, their exclusion from and contact with wider society. Of course, some camps are better than others. Ironically, Tempelhof Airport, built by Hitler's chief architect, is being used as an emergency shelter for new arrivals in Berlin. Now, some people have argued, when they've looked at these sort of containers within this um, defunct airport, some people argue that good provision and kind treatment encourages more people to move. Surely, this is just a way of responding in a humane way. As the German MP said, we don't want anyone who's experienced war and terror to have to sleep on the streets. After all that then, the journey crossing the border, over water, over land, contained in camps, detention centers, in holding places, after all of that, and given the context and the background, what chances are there for us to forge long-lasting conviviality, long-lasting relationships of conviviality. Because, but alongside the images of the journeys, of the borders and the camps, there have been images that have demonstrated an outpouring of compassion, of volunteers distributing supplies, journalists following refugees and documenting their journeys. And there's been all kinds of different welcomes. One of the most profound and widespread developments, it seems to me, has been a visual language of welcome. In many places, the moment and the place of arrival has become a site of welcome. An overwhelming demonstration of welcoming, banners, handmade placards, shop signs, graffiti, a tactile gesture, face-to-face -face contact, a blanket over the shoulder, whether at Malmo, Central Station, Copenhagen's comfort zone, Berlin, Toronto, so although land may not always signal the end of an arduous journey and the place of safety, the beach, the port, the airport, the station, are places that have historically always marked the moment of arrival. And we can see here the wind rush from Jamaica, from Jamaica in 1948, the point of arrival that is often featured in the visual representation, the visual history of migration to the UK. This is boarding at Tilbury Docks. Or Stansted Airport in 1972, one of the first planes on the tarmac that carried exiled Ugandan Asians to Britain. But today, it's not just the physical place of arrival, as we saw in the past, that we're viewing on our TV screens, whether the airport tarmac, the port, or the railway station. What we're witnessing is the sight, the moment, and the form of welcome. And as we see images of refugees being actively welcomed in one place, there's a spin-off to other places. Now, of course, it might be easier to welcome others than to live amongst them. Welcoming may be a polit political strategy. It may reinforce paternalism. It might reinforce a Eurocentric idea about the civility of the West. But despite all of that, perhaps there is potential for the welcome to have long-lasting, even generational effects. The welcome may have a profound effect on people's perceptions 
of a place and its inhabitants, their affiliation, their connection with the place, and their present and future sense of belonging and safety. And importantly, on the kinds of collective and convivial cultures that can be produced through mo movement. Now, we don't know this yet. We're still at the moment of welcome, or perhaps not welcoming. So perhaps we need to refer to historical examples where people have been welcomed in the past. Because as one refugee said, this town has greeted and treated me well. I'd like to make it my home. Angela Merkel said, they need help to learn German. They should find a job quickly. Many of them will become new citizens of our country. But importantly, she says, if we do it well, this will bring more opportunities than risks, responding to a particular discourse around refugees. And of course, Trudeau in Canada. So yes, it may be political. It may be strategic. It may be very calculated. Refugees are important for the economy in certain countries. But it may also have all kinds of unexpected positive consequences in the long term. I spent so much of my academic career critiquing every policy, every movement, everything that happens. And I feel perhaps as I'm getting older, I'm getting a bit softer. But I don't think so. I think there is something about a welcome. There's something about being tactile in a digital and overly digital, perhaps, age. Someone recently wrote, the journey ends when people feel welcome. So I think there is power in the welcome. Of course, it doesn't guarantee conviviality, but surely it's better than not welcoming, and not everyone is welcoming. There are those who advocate sending refugees back to home that effectively no longer exist. And of course, there are problems around the ways in which different forms of welcome are interpreted, the different cultural expressions of appreciation. So you may be a volunteer holding up a placard at Copenhagen's comfort zone, and the refugee doesn't hug you and say, thank you, thank you, that's so kind. There may be different ways, and different ways of thinking about that kind of welcome and that kind of appreciation. But the welcome, of course, is momentary. What's important is what happens next and what role can representations play in that? Well, Paul Gilroy says that we can't legislate for a multicultural society. We can't legislate for convivial culture. Britain tried to do that in the 1970s and 1980s with multicultural policies. And he argues you can't legislate for people to get on, for people to engage with each other, for people to respect each other, issues around tolerance. He says that there's a number of ways in which convivial cultures are being made on the ground, not legislated for, but on the ground. And I want to just mention two of them. The first is social media, and the second is alternative representations. I think there's a very important role in creating new spaces for communication and representations, for dialogue, debate, and conversation through social media. We saw with the image of Ilan Kurdi that images and ideas spread ever more quickly, that refugees using social media to pass on information, strategies, advice, support, track lost family members, the power and use of social media has also differentiated this particular movement from others. As Lem Sisse says, migration is at the heart of who we are. When we press send on our phones, we've populated the world with new ideas without visas, border controls, or baggage allowance. And thanks to my colleague Gemma Sue, I've recently heard that you can now buy the Swiss-developed Cloud Chasers Journey of Hope app. It's been de developed to raise our awareness of the migrant crisis. I haven't played it yet. Given the power of representations, there's also a need for alternative and new kinds of representations that reflect very different politics. There's a growing recognition of the significance of alternative cinema, novels, and art that are often superseded by popular genre, but nevertheless attract audiences from a range of different backgrounds. And the importance of an ongoing dialogue that addresses issues of refugees, that happens on the ground at a very un everyday, mundane level. Refugees welcome, tourists go home, invoking and using that macro politics to make a very micro level local political argument. 
There's lots of play and subversion of representations that are very powerful. You see here on, your, on the left, you want the refugees to go home. Splendid, so when do you leave? So there's a lot of play and subversion of these representations, and I don't think we should deny that that is part of an ongoing dialogue. It's something that can spring up very quickly. You see one placard and then another one. And one of the ones that, that I've been trying to show here is that there's lots of banners that say refugees go home. And out of that sprung up a whole kind of set of symbolic representations and material, real representations. Syrians can't just go home. 8% of Syrian refugees want to, only 8% of Syrian refugees want to stay in Europe. They would like to go home, but they can't. So there is an importance, I think, about alternative representations. They're powerful. They make us stop. They make us question. But a word of caution, because even alternative representations can unwittingly reproduce particularly powerful negative representations, reinforcing fears and stereotypes. Robert Graves and Didier Maddock Jones produced postcards from the future for the Museum of London 2010 to raise awareness about climate change. And there were a series of six postcards, and this is one of them. This exhibition and events generated unprecedented media interest and public attention. They were seen to be radical, critical, and challenging. But what is it that this image tells us? It says if we don't do something about climate change, we'll be swamped by third world migrants building up a, swamp, a, a slum around Buckingham Palace. So even something that attempts to be critiquing certain kinds of representations, making a political argument, can end up invoking that taken for granted way in which we think about mobility. So I don't have any conclusions, but I think there's some ongoing challenges. We've been here before, and we will again. And here are some representations around the, the exile and the, ref, the Ugandan Asian refugees from 1972. Maybe we need to look at the not-so-distant path to try and understand and remember what we can learn from what's happened previously. What can we do? Well, the first is to be informed, to be able to challenge representations, to have the tools to critique them, to look behind the message and to produce alternative messages. We've made many advances in our representations, but I think one area that continues to bedevil our attempts at achieving social justice and producing convivial cultures is that we don't see others as our contemporaries. We see them as migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, stealing our jobs, occupying our houses, as criminals, as pre-modern. And ultimately, they are just too different to us. And at times like this, there's a tendency for old racisms, intolerance, hatreds and hatreds towards already existing diasporas to be unearthed and resurfaced. Perhaps the start is to know the individual behind the label. As soon as they move, they become just a refugee, an asylum seeker. But who else are they? What skills, jobs, families, adventures, aspirations, desires do they have? As one refugee said, now we don't even have our names. We have a number in the barcode of our refugee identification. If we don't understand the lives lived before being labelled, it'll be very hard to see others as our contemporaries and to cultivate any kind of solidarity instead of hatred or pity. And I think we need to provide opportunities for more civic engagement rather than increasing containment. We need to acknowledge the skills that people bring, provide opportunities for them to be creative with those skills, and remember the multiple experiences, the skills that they've acquired in just surviving, that they've accumulated and shared knowledge about how to cross spatial and cultural borders, how to maneuver themselves through different bureaucracies, their ability to subvert restrictions, negotiate boundaries, their interactions and their sensitivities. Rather than reinforcing a parochialism, what I'd like to suggest is that they are surely amongst the most worldly. Perhaps what we fear, then, is our own parochialism. Well, I think this is surely a story about humanity. Representing it should be humane as well as accurate. And sadly, most of what we hear and read is neither. Thank you.
Thank you. I told you so. <laughs> so I think we now have a chance to do a question and answers. So I believe there is a, is there a microphone? There's, an, there's a microphone. And the microphone uh, will respond to your hand being proudly raised in the air. And I'm a bit blind, so you have to do it really, <laughs> really well. So let's take a few. Don't be shy. Over there. Thank you. Uber, that was uh, hello. Is this working? Yeah, yeah. Uber, that was a lovely, um, really interesting, uh, thoughtful, uh, and positive uh, presentation. Very positive about uh, things. Um, I just wanted to a couple of things. One is that um, the context in which migration takes place. So uh, I think that one of the things that I felt possibly was missing from this was the um, the enormous migrations. Uh, before the 20th century of co colonizing migrations, which I think that often people completely forget about the fact that uh, North America is, a, is essentially a settler colony uh, and Australia, you know, there, there, there are enormous things before, before the arrival of, um, you know, once various parts of the world are packed out, then, then beginning of the 20th century, we have border controls coming in. Um, and I think there's an important relationship there that, that, that is deliberately uh, omitted. You know, this is one of these am amnesias which is carefully constructed. Um, the other thing about Ireland Kurdi, I think that um, it, was, uh, it was very striking um, as somebody who's worked in the, you know, this area for, for a good, n good many years. It's very striking how that made a, quite a change to the standard narrative from the media, as you say. Um, I think that um, for me, suggesting that Cameron, that, that that was responsible for Cameron's change in tone. I'm not sure about that. Um, I think that um, there was a big push in within Europe to start to take on refugees, and, and a number of people would, would consider that Cameron um, somehow did the least he could possibly do. Um, I might even, I, I would go further and argue that that was, that was a moment where uh, that people who are working in support of refugees, um, organizations and institutions and writers and theorists and so on, um, that a strong push at that particular time over the next month or two could have really given, you know, given them, um, put, put a kind of a bad mark on the whole policy of the UK. And in a way, I think it's appalling the fact, and probably a failure of refugee, organi refugee support organisations and activists to not, um, to not get uh, Cameron uh, to, to, to increase the numbers he's, he's, um, he's taking. And I think that's a, that's a significant failure that we, which we need to address. I'm going to forget your yeah. first question. You, is that question mark at the end of this <laughs> statement? Or, or? Well, I'm, I'm well, gonna, okay, I'm that, 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 oh, well, I think that's a significant failure, and I think we need to think about Absolutely. that very carefully, yeah. because I think that, that there was an opportunity um, that, that there was a door open there yeah. for refugee support organizations and activists to, to, to move on that. I, do, I, yeah. I don't think it's gone yet. I think that, you know, on the anniversary of the 2nd of September this year, um, there could be things that, uh, that, that resurrect some of that. I think that, but I think that the, there are some serious considerations uh, there. Thank so anyway, you, Karen. thank you. Okay, so um, before I forget, shall I just answer, yeah, respond answer to that, that first? Answer that before you forget. Um, of yeah, course, you're right. absolutely right about the... I mean, the British, British colonial interests were maintained and sustained through the forcible movement of people, whether it was slaves and dentured labour that were mobile and then contained. And I think you're absolutely right. And I did actually have a section at the beginning about slavery and indentured labour, but um, I was very wary about how long I would have to speak... And uh, yeah, absolutely. And the second is, and I think you raise a very important, really important issue there about um, cause and effect of representations. And, and I did skim over that. It's very difficult when we, you know, did people go and stand with, you know, placards because they saw something on the television that made them do that? We, we don't, I mean, there is audience response surveys. There's all kinds of ways in which people who study media will capture that kind of information. And I think you're absolutely right. We need to be more careful, and I need to be much more rigorous in terms of looking at that cause and effect of a particular representation. I think that's an important point that you raise. Thank you. We have space for more questions. Over there. Gentlemen over there. Uh, 
Um, you had direct quotes from both David Cameron and Angela Merkel in the presentation there. To what extent do you think the rhetoric and the personal politics of Europe's leaders has an impact on refugees themselves and the places they choose to, to, to come to? Well, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, as I was trying to say at the beginning is that I just, I feel that a lot of the, the shape of the journey, the trajectory that, that um, people move through is very much shaped by border regimes. And that without that, there would be a different direction. There would be different kinds of trajectories that would be taken. So I do feel that they make a difference. And I think what's really interesting, and one of the issues that I wanted to develop a bit more, was the way in which the refugees use social media to inform other refugees who are behind them about, you know, you've got to pass through this border within three days because it's going to be closed, or you need to move into that direction, or we found a place that you can cross the river from Greece to Macedonia, or a hole in the fence. And I think that there are, there are, there are other things apart from just the political leaders, but I think it's very much a, a sort of a grounded conversation, grounded um, stories and narratives that are told amongst the refugees that start directing um, their journeys and that, that talk about the journeys. And I, I'm not saying that policies aren't important. Of course, they are important. And I think there are real and imagined beliefs um, amongst refugees about which country they would like to end up in. And I think that's not just about leaders. I think that is about something which has a longer colonial his history. I think it is about wider and broader issues of representation of those nations. Gentleman over here. When your parents went back from, on their adventure from UK to India, did they need a visa and did they have a passport? That's a very good question. Um, well, when I mentioned about them being on the border of Egypt and Sudan, uh, they were actually trying to get, into, to get a visa to go into Sudan, which they didn't get. And um, this is the early 1950s, so they couldn't actually go to Sudan at the time. Um, no, they didn't need a visa when they went back, but they certainly needed lots of visas as they were traveling around different places. Should we take two questions, one after the other? When, can I tell you a little story while we, the oh, microphone yes. travels? Do. When I arrived as a student in, uh, in, in the 80s, and as an academic migrant, which is a type of migration that many of us share uh, from France, and I had to report to the police on a monthly basis. And I, I told that story to my student, and my student's response was, um, were you a convicted felon? <laughs> Uh, and, and you said yes. And I said, well, in a way. <laughs> Sorry, Alison. Thank you very much. That was a, a tremendous talk. Thank you. I, I'm, I was interested in your ideas about whether or not we have the uh, ability to, to, to read some of the images and some of those really um, um, impactful images that, that you showed. And I just wondered if you have any sense of ways in which we can read those images in a, in a more educated way, perhaps, or in a more informed way? Are there things that we can be doing uh, in order to educate us in that way? Thank you. That's a really good question. And I'm not a media... Um, I'm, I'm not an academic in, in media studies, and, and I'm sure there, and there are lots of different ways and skills and tools and techniques about the, how you can read behind a particular image. But I think that we're already doing a lot of things. I mean, first of all, you're all here. You know, you, you've come today because, well, maybe you've just come because you come to every alumni lecture, and that's great, <laughs> and I look forward to seeing you next year. But some of you are here because of the topic. We're making choices all the time about the newspapers that we read, the radio programs, the documentaries that the, we watch, the people that we talk to. I think we're already very skilled. But what we need is to actually think through some of the representations that are now taken for granted. It's taken for granted that we refer to this as a refugee crisis. 
And I think we need to ask, well, who's it a crisis for? Because when we read the papers, they're not talking about a crisis for the refugees. They're talking about it's a crisis for Europe. And so I keep saying so-called refugee crisis. And then people say to me, don't you think it's a crisis? No, I, I guess I do think it's a crisis, but not a crisis in that. So I think we're already unpacking um, uh, you know, a lot of the representations. I think the definitional issues are really interesting because, of course, we used to use a language of, of immigrant in the UK. We, we don't really tend to use that very much now. Now, Al Jazeera English say that they don't want to use the term migrant. So language shifts and changes all the time. So I think part of what we need to learn is to read the shift, is to read what is, what is there between the gap of different kinds of representations in the space of those different representations. What are we trying to say? So I think it's less important the note on terminology that the BBC uses at the bottom of its website than the fact that they have a note on terminology. That's new, that's different, and that's telling us something, I think, quite important. We have time, I think, for one last question. This is, um, excuse, excuse my ignorance, you're the people in the know, I'm just a confused citizen on all of this. I'm confused. <laughs> but but um, I, I liked your point about the, the bit about the, you know, the story behind the, the person themselves, and you were saying they're just a number and a barcode. And I don't understand, or maybe maybe there is an, an unpacking the, the, the story. Is it already going on, or is there somewhere where these, you know, the people coming over, you know, they're a family of four, a doctor or a, a lawyer, or, or my kids love this, my kids. Is there a story being taken from these people to almost humanize them again rather than yeah. make them be a barcode? Mm. Because I think people will be a lot more understanding and less scared in inverted commas and, and it wouldn't be such a crisis if we knew but I don't know how I know you're not offering solutions but I just wonder whether that is a solution and whether it is already happening we're just not hearing about it I, that, that's thank you um, I think that there there are a lot of like a lot of projects where life histories are being gathered I think there's a lot of self-representation I think there's a lot of communication that's going on which isn't it, in the pub isn't public and mediatized in the same way and i think in a sense we need to we want to demand that on the other hand politically we have to be very careful because we don't want to say you're okay because you're a doctor and you're not because oh you, you're unemployed in syria so i worry about who making the distinction and overly individualizing you know, and I think we have to be quite careful then. So we want lots and lots of individual stories that tell a collective one. And I, and I think the example of, of, of the doctor that you, you used is, no, but I think it's important because we often think about brain drain when people leave, but there's incredible brain waste as people move. There are, peop there are lawyers working in, in bars in Barcelona, not that if there's a problem working in a bar in Barcelona, but there are people who are trained as lawyers. There, you know, how many Ethiopian taxi drivers have you come across? You know, there, there, there's sort of, there's people who came from particular, this is why I think they're so skilled, they're so worldly in certain ways. They've had to maneuver themselves in incredible ways. So I think we need to learn about the individual stories, but we need to also learn about the collective. One, one last question. Okay. You said that a small proportion of the migrants want to come to Europe. I wonder what, whether you have a view as to uh, international work with the governments from which the migrants are coming should focus their attention to try and establish more humane regimes in the countries from which the migrants are coming? Well, that's the key question, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's the one about the causes of mobility, the motivations, the push from, from war and conflict and political oppression. And that's, a, that's, a, that's the big issue. That's really something that we, we do need to look at. And that's why I was saying at the beginning, I'm, I'm not really talking about the context and the background out of which people move that I wanted to focus on the journey. But clearly that's something that we need to look at. I, I didn't mean to say that 
a few, only a few want to come to Europe. I don't, I don't know the statistics of what, about people's desires and aspirations of where they move to. What I was trying to say was that only 8% in that particular study, and beware of my own representation there, but only 8% said that they wanted to stay in Europe, that many of them want to go, they want to go home, they want to go back. And, and we have examples, and me and my friend Penny the other night were sitting in, in a restaurant having a conversation about this and saying, well, um, who actually gave me lots of, of great tips about the talk today, so thanks, Penny. Um, <laughs> but we were talking about how there was a huge kind of surge of, of articles and, and, and programs and news reports about um, the number of Polish people they, we thought were going to come to Britain once they had been sort of acceded to the EU. And of course, January the 1st, that was the case. But by July the 1st, many of them had gone back. They just wanted to come and check it out. It's like my parents would have come and gone and come back, but they felt compelled to stay in a sense that once they'd arrived. So borders aren't just about allowing people in, but they also confine you and keep you in a place where it's hard to, they're not porous, and I think for some people, very porous for others. Thank you for your question. Well, I'd like you to join me in thanking Professor Uma Kateri for her lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, I, also, I also would like you to to, to remind you that if you want to follow up this conversation, two things can happen. One is you can join us downstairs for a more sociable and convivial moment. Another one is that from the privacy of your home, you can actually check the websites, the wonderful websites of the GDI and, of course, my own institute, HCRI. Um, and I think, in general, discover the wealth of extraordinary work that is done by dozens and dozens of academics across the University of Manchester, which makes us proud to belong to this university, to be part of its history, and hopefully its future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.